you can turn really good genes off by bad behavior. So it's like, figuring out the journey and, you know, really realizing what you need to do in a disciplined way. Have you ever seen someone living an amazing life and thought to yourself, how'd they get so lucky? If you are not currently living a life that's on your terms, a life by your design, then this podcast series is for you. This is the More Confidence with Luna Guy podcast. And in this special season, I'm going to be interviewing people who are living a life by design, living a life on their terms. And I'm going to find out once and for all if it is just luck or there's something more going on. Let's dive in. Brenda, it is such an honor to have you on this conversation today. Thank you. I'm really looking forward to it. There is something really spectacular about having a conversation with someone who really understands what it's like to achieve wellness. And, and when you, you know, were doing your intake form, we were having a conversation off air around this. You had said that people often underestimate the amount of work it takes to get well and stay well. What do you mean by that? I think often that phrase, or oh, you're just so lucky you have energy, or you're so lucky you don't have these issues, or you're so lucky that you can call around the floor with your grandchildren or whatever, you know. People don't understand the first stop where I came from, you know, 40 years ago and total opposite of wellness and don't understand the different steps that you've had to take with a lot of intentionality to get you where you are. Some of it is maybe lucky because of genetics, but you can turn really good genes off by bad behavior. (laughs) So it's like figuring out the journey and you know really realizing what you need to do in a, in a disciplined way um what i call my no matter what these happen almost all the time uh because i feel better when i do it and so i'm disciplined and, and continue to do that so yeah i think there's an element of of luck in that we come all from different backgrounds we have different economic abilities we have different things that we've been given along the way So there is some good fortune, I think, that happens. Uh, But overall, that good fortune has to be, I think, partnered with discipline and effort, or it doesn't really prove as fruitful, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, and certainly in our, you know, in our in our youth, you know, when we're teenagers and in our twenties, we can get away with a significant, (laughs) significantly more. We can get away with, you know, I've just reached forty. And really noticing that, you know what, I only have this one body and I need to look after it if I want to get into old age well. Yes. It, it's really interesting you said, you know, of course there's going to be different, you know, economic factors, there's going to be different yes. genetic factors, environmental factors. But I think we all have met, let's say, a quote, skinny person, someone yes. who maybe maybe society would perceive as well that isn't at all, that smokes or drinks or eats plenty of sugar, that is always tired, that, you know, is still is not overweight but is is perceived as healthy but is not healthy at all. You said, Brenda, that that you weren't always well. What was what was tell me about that. Sure. So Uh, rheumatic fever, heart condition as a child when I was five, and uh, not so much that there was a lot of residual effect from that in that after hospitalization, etc. I didn't have a heart murmur or anything like that, as can be the case sometimes. But at that time, the treatment post-hospitalization for rheumatic fever was a daily dose of antibiotics. So from the age of five to the age of 12, we moved to a different province when that wasn't the prescribed treatment. I had antibiotics every single day of my life for seven years. So nowadays we know that that's not usually all that helpful, depending on what kind of condition you might have. So it just meant that I cycled into this. My my family used to joke that I got four colds a year and each of them lasted a season long. So it was like perpetual, you know, cold, flus, sinuses. I ended up late teens, early 20s with thyroid condition, um, a lot of anxiety, some of that to do with just 
very loving family of origin, but their own challenges, you know. And uh, then I became a social worker, loved, loved, loved my job, and I uh, worked with adolescents that were seriously traumatized, going through the cracks of the attorney general, mm -hmm. mental health, education, and social services, and ended up with an ulcer. <laughs> so it's like, you know, I was kind of this uh, like basket case, mid-20s person who fell asleep on the couch as soon as she got home from work. My husband and I would go to a movie. I'd fall asleep in the movie theaters, you know, and just kind of someone that was not a vibrant picture of health. So, yeah, there was this trajectory of, you know, loved doing lots of things like sports and was very physically active, but, oh, my goodness, like fatigue, insomnia, you know, like I mentioned, thyroid, anxiety, all of those kind of things just heaped on top of each other and a lot of gut health. You can't do antibiotics antibiotics for that long and not end up with a pretty messed up intestinal terrain, that's for sure. So yeah, that was me. Brenda, do you think that the, the world kind of views that regular level of fatigue, like that idea that we come home from work and we're exhausted, do you think the world sees that as normal? Unfortunately, I, I think we do. And even if we are, like I was doing also getting ready to nod off mid-afternoon, and ending up in the, you know, staff room, we had an honor box that was staffed every week with the, you know, cookies and biscuits and all this kind of stuff. And you just put, for me, half your paycheck in there when you got paid kind of a deal. So people even do that fuel on coffee, even bad government <laughs> coffee and cookies and sugar to forestay kind of that fatigue mid-afternoon to get them through till they can fall asleep on the couch when they get home. So yeah, I just think people expect that they'll wake up not rested, spend a lot of the day not rested, and then just go to bed and not rested. It's like a perpetual belief that we exist, I think, you know. Mm. And that that's yeah. just life and that and that we're jump-starting. You know, I, I see this culture and, and, and I'm probably going to get a whole bunch of haters for this. Just fair <laughs> warning, it, you might be one of them, I do not know. But I, I see this huge culture. I mean, I live in Australia. I don't know what the what the what the, co what the coffee culture like is is in oh, Canada. But big. you know, like it's 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 a, a complete addiction that is so socially acceptable that people have mugs that you know don't talk to me before I've had my coffee. You know, um, coffee first, then work. It, it, it is this, I, and people will the language that people use. I need to go get a coffee. It isn't, I want a coffee, it's I need. And, yeah. and people, like the first thing, they cannot function until they have this stimulant in their body. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, I mean, in, in your expertise, Brenda, what's that doing to us? So if you would have talked to me 10 years ago, I would have said, you know, it's totally impacting your adrenal glands, that, that you're getting a, a rise of cortisol, that the caffeine is basically basically mimicking the cortisol and in long term almost suppressing the adrenal glands ability to regulate cortisol well. So I just had all my clients and get off coffee. You know, just minimize it one cup a day if you're really, you know, use it for comfort, get decaf. So that was my pitch. That was what I was taught as a holistic nutritionist and that's what I advocated. Then I started studying genetics more, and lo and behold, this is when you talk, you know, about what things have you had to shift. I mean, talk about eating humble pie. I now have to prescribe, even though nutritionists, of course, don't diagnose or treat, but recommend that some of my clients actually have one to three cups of coffee a day. And it has to do with the way they detox through their liver. There's certain phases that happen in there. Some of them, you know, need the support of being uh, slowed down. So I would have been a blanket, get off the caffeine. And now I'm like, probably get off the caffeine until I find out what your genetics are. So wow. you learn, you never too, never too old to learn new things. Yeah. I remember you saying that about, you know, once upon a time, you also, and maybe that was 10 years ago as well, you thought that everybody should be vegetarian as well, that you had this prescription for yourself almost going, 
vegetarian's the way to go. It's the most healthiest. Tell me about well, what was it like back then when you believed that everybody did need to be vegetarian and how has that changed now? So it was a really well-rounded vegetarian diet set on whole foods. So it wasn't like a pop and chip vegetarian diet. It was, you know, yeah. grinding your flour. Uh, we had some friends that kept chickens for us. And so we had farm fresh, you know, eggs, that kind of thing. Um, but as I think a lot of times wellness practitioners do is we get really blinded and what works well for us, we just fall into the assumption that this is going to be amazing for everyone. So uh, we have five kids. And so I merrily led my husband and our five children on this vegetarian journey for about 18 months. I felt amazing, really, really good on it. Um, I just was oblivious, like consciously oblivious to the fact that my husband was gaining weight, my super athletic, really big German, you know, six foot two, his thighs, the size of my waist, kind of big guy, was packing on the pounds around the gut, you know, and really cranky. One of our, we got called into the school, one of our kids, uh, teachers were intimating that uh, they had uh, ADHD and we should be looking at potentially some medication. And I remember coming home from that meeting and thinking, what the heck is going on? Like, this kid's been in school for four years. There's never been any indication that this is something that could be happening. And I had this epiphany that, you know, the only thing that we've changed is we've gone just this completely vegetarian. So no animal products other than eggs. eggs. And we also really cut our fat intake down, uh, which is easy to do if you're not eating meat and skin on chicken and things like that. So uh, I came across an American nutritionist by the name of Anne Louise Gittleman. She's written lots of books. This particular book was um, Your Body Knows Best. And there was a little survey form in there um, it's called Metabolic Typing or Body Typing. It's based on traditional Chinese medicine and Ayurvedic medicine, just based on the fact that people are different and we should probably be fueling different because of that. And I remember distinctly giving my husband this survey. and in the, this would be 20 plus years, now 25 years that this happened. I have used a similar survey with hundreds and hundreds of clients and, you know, people in conferences and things like that. And I've never had someone with a higher score in the need for fat and animal protein than my husband. I remember I, I looked at his score and I just went, Oh my goodness, like we have to go buy you a grass fed cow like this afternoon. You know, he was just like, right hallelujah. And I, it was like, I'm someone who does tons of research, but then learns as it stinks in in front of you. And I mean, I watched him, I got my husband back, you know, smartness, balanced mood, pastoral kind of kind guy, uh, sh shed the 25 pounds in like six weeks. It was ridiculous. Wow. And, and I'm not a huge weight loss advocate like I really believe people are all different sizes and shapes and we're wired genetically differently like that but it was too much for his frame even his Arnold Schwarzenegger frame that was too much mm -hmm. and I distinctly remember thinking okay you need to uh, eat a little humble pie here and you need to recognize that people are extremely different and uh, you've got to start practicing differently in your nutrition council I was in some newspaper columns, that kind of thing. You need to start advocating for non one size size fit all, fits all. So that was a biggie. That was a biggie. Yeah. And that's huge. You know, Brenda, I, I think that there's, there's something called the, 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 the sunk cost fallacy. And it's a, have you heard of that term before? Yeah. But yeah. For, the, for the listeners at home, the sunk cost fallacy is, is a economic term. Now, you know, keep your ears tuned. It's not going to be boring. I trust me. It's, it's, it's when you've invested significantly in something that isn't working, you are more likely to put more money into it because you're like, well, I've already lost a hundred thousand dollars. If I put another hundred thousand dollars in it, I'm going to, you know, I, I could get the money back. And, you know, you see people do that with gambling, uh, with poker machines, you know, people like, but if I just put another hundred dollars in, I could win the jackpot. And I think that 
many of us can do that with our beliefs. We yeah. can do that with our mindset and our and the way that we've learned something. But hang on a second, I've been teaching this for 20 years. I've yeah. been teaching this for 10 years. I've been thinking this way since I was a child. Yeah. And 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 even if it's not working, we hold on to for dear life. You know, we've we we've, we've dug ourselves a hole, so we just keep digging the hole. Yes. It yes. it would have taken a lot for you to professionally change your position what what was that like internally for you so do you know much about the enneagrams about uh the personality kind of typing type of a thing it's I, yeah it's I, I, I do a okay. bit but g- g- okay. give me some reference point for the audience too so it's just it, it it's old it's ancient i think part of its roots actually are in the catholic church even if i'm remembering correctly but it, it's a different types of surveys you can do and you end up on this spectrum of personality, a lot of how you perceive yourself, who perceive the world. So I'm a, I'm a one Enneagram. And one of the mm-hmm. biggest things for ones is they like to be right. And it's not even, like I've analyzed this a lot over the years since I've known this is what I am. It's not even that you want to be right so that other people are wrong and you're better than other people. It, so much of it is, I don't want to steer people wrong. Like we, as it's a social accuracy, worker, right? it's, yes, it's being yes, correct. It's having, yes, it's accuracy. Exactly. Being right for the sake yes. of I- I- ego, even though that can come into it, it's about being yes. uh, distinct in accuracy. Yes. Thank Precise. you. That's a, that, that's a better way to describe it. So whether in social work or the 20 years we co-pastored or now as a nutritionist or as a parent or a wife, whatever, I want to be accurate in it. So learning that, oh my goodness, I wasn't. There's, there's, for me, there's often an initial kind of a shame and humiliation that washes over you, embarrassment, because you know you weren't right in this. You were partially right, but you hadn't extrapolated this the way that you should have. Um, I'm, I've been wrong enough times now that I that doesn't last too long because I realize that I'm not going to continue to learn and grow. I'm not going to break these paradigms and biases that have kept me kind of chained and would keep me throwing more hundreds of thousands of dollars in them if I'm not going to keep my hands open and be prepared at any point mm. to learn that something that I believed is wrong. And mm. so, yeah, it's hard. Uh, but out of that came both of my books were based on <laughs> that. So it's kind of like, okay, and then I'm going to correct this and get the word out that a lot of the confusion that we feel in the wellness industry is because we are all of us are trying to do things the same way whether that's eating or sleeping or exercise or calming ourselves or whatever so uh i guess after i have my initial wave of embarrassment i (laughs) hunker down and say okay what can i learn from this and how can i maybe save some other people having to have that same mistake happen for them that learning shorten someone else's learning curve i guess Mm. yeah yeah. And I suppose also knowing that that we on, we can only work with the information that we have at the time. So when when we even at, not as not even as practitioners, but as recipients of practitioners of yeah. the world and the information, to understand that that the people giving us advice, you know, people listening to this podcast, people attending your courses or your programs, reading your books, including mine as well that that we are human we are fallible so we're yeah. only working with the information that we have thus thus yeah. far and as soon yeah. as we have newer information you know we are willing to adapt the yeah. the processes and and protocols that we have and i think that 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 is important because if we don't adapt the protocols and processes we end up we 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 don't you know it's it's adapt or die you know it's evolve yeah. or or perish we yeah. must be able to have be adaptive in all of our beliefs all of yeah. our beliefs about everything well you know what I, you know I'm, I'm really open to god and saying if if everything that i the way that i've been teaching for the last you know 10 15 years is incorrect yeah. i'm sure it's not everything but if there are things well you know i will i will take the i will take the hit Yes. Show yes. me something new. Yes. 
yeah. Brenda, you know, for you, it, it's it, it's an interesting, you know, when I put the call out, I'm looking for people who are living life on their terms, you know, the, the people who you usually get told that they're so lucky. And I love that you have come to this conversation because I think that when it comes to health and well-being, I know for myself, it has certainly in the past just been that's just and 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 I'm gonna say it. This is what an old version of me would have said. Oh, it's just the skinny bitches, right? The skinny bitches just get to eat whatever they want. They, you know, they 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 don't have to struggle in the same way that yeah. that I do. You know, I I grew up. Well, I suppose the word I would have used back then was fat. Like you know, I was fat yeah. from a very young age. Environmentally, there was you know I ate too much. You know, and I don't know genetically what the what the layers of that would have been, but I was I was fed too much also. Yeah. You know, I can really see that the behaviors in my household and all with love, you know, yeah. all with all with love and, and but you know, my mum also had five children and she didn't know any better. And I'm the youngest and you know, we just got fed what we could get fed. And, you know, economically not yeah. you know, not poor but needed to make the food spread out further. So that meant that we chalked up things with a lot more rice, a lot more pasta, a lot more carbohydrate-y kind of foods. Yeah. And I'm not demonizing carbohydrates, but, oh, but, yeah. but saying that it was often filled, the food was filled. Yeah. yeah. So have some bread, have some, you know, rather than mix of protein, fat, carbohydrates. Yeah. You have, you now are living a life where would you say that you're well? Is that, you know, that you're well, that you're in a space of wellness and vibrancy? Yes, absolutely. And, you know, I usually tell my clients those four things. I want you to be regularly checking all the time to see how you're doing. And the one Everybody is... Everybody get your we, pens ready. What are the four <laughs> things, Brenda? They're, they're not going to be earth shattering. But the first one is physical energy. It's like when you said to me, you know, how were you as a social worker? Well, how is much of the world? Like physical energy is number one. Like you mm. want to be fueling yourself in a way that produces more energy. Every system in the body uses energy from the digestive system, mm. you know, transmitters, everything. So it's really important that you're always keeping up kind of a pulse on how am I going to get up in the morning? Oh, I feel fantastic. I look forward to face the day. So both that consistent thing and then also energy with regard to like reserves. So uh, I love to push myself, okay, especially when it's something that might be outside. So I ran half marathons for a few years. And then now more recent years, my husband and I have been doing some kind of exotic things like, you know, decided to learn to scuba dive. Uh, we went, you uh, know, a, a really crazy thing, which was super fun. Um, when you couldn't do a lot of travel because of COVID, we ended up getting flown in with two of our very closest friends to a lake chain that is north of us and literally dropped on a lake where our rented canoes were waiting for us. and paddled and portaged for six days. We saw only one other set of people the whole six days. My husband said to me later, he said, you, I could, your cells were vibrating. Like you were just like one with nature, you know? So I, like, that took a lot of stamina to do that. Yeah. And so we hiked down into the Grand Canyon back up again. Like it's like, do you have not only energy for every day, but if you really want to do something wild and wonderful, could you, do you have the stamina for that? So that's number one. Mm -hmm. Number two is mental clarity. Once you start getting your energy elevated, then you have the resources to be able to detoxify, deal with candida overgrowth, you know, take care of extra, whatever, free radicals that are circulating around. And that means that you should actually get mentally sharper. Uh, about the time I was collapsing in my mid 20s, I remember a friend of mine saying to me, number one, ticking off all these things that she thought were wrong with me. And the last thing she said was, and frankly, I think you used to be smarter than you are now. <laughs> Thanks a lot, you know. <laughs> but it had to do with that whole mental clarity component. Like I don't, you're not as with it. You're not on the ball. You're not able to remember things. So 
that's the third one. The next one has to do with balanced emotions. And, you know, as a, as a social worker, as a former co-pastor, it's like emotions are valid, every single one you have. So I'm not saying I want to have us dampen them down or ignore certain ones or whatever. But most of us understand the concept of balanced emotions where we are absolutely able to be joyful at certain things and we uh, experience grief over certain things. We're angry at injustice, those kind of things. So we have a range of them. But we also know that it's not doesn't feel very cool to be standing outside of ourselves, watching ourselves going, I cannot believe I am responding like this, okay? So that's what I mean by mitigating those incidents where we're, mm. you know, going to be forced to apologize ad nauseum. Out of because control, just, really, you know, yes, like exactly. that we, that we yes. cannot manage them, right, yes. you know? Yeah. Yes, we are not self-regulating well, okay? And then the last one, the last point has to do with digestion and, and bloating and inflammation. And so if we are eating well, if we are sleeping well, if our cortisol is well regulated throughout the day, we're, we're self-regulating our emotions and things like that, we should not be having a great deal of bloating and inflammation. Now, you know, so if people eat a meal and they feel like they're six months pregnant, male or female, something's wrong with what the food is that you're putting on your plate. So you want to pay attention to that because we should be digesting well, not having that kind of blow. So those are four things that you mm. just periodically touch base you could also tack on a fifth one a cheater one which would be how are you sleeping all right so uh you should be falling asleep easily sleeping soundly through the night if you wake up to the bathroom fall asleep you know relatively easy when you come back to bed and again waking up rested so those are kind of your five litmus test things that you want to be you know periodically checking in with yourself and getting good tick marks and if not doing something about it you know I think the vast majority of people listening to this right now are sitting there going, no energy, my, I'm, I don't, I, you know, I have mental fogginess, my emotions are out of control, I often have digestive problems and I don't sleep well. I, I kind of feel like the vast majority of humans are like that or would like to improve that, you know, like oh, I could sleep better or, you know, my emotions could be more regulated or yeah. I would like more energy. Considering, Brenda, you you said before and as we opened this podcast that people don't recognize the, you know, they, they underestimate the amount of work that it takes to get and to stay well. C considering that, getting well is deliberate. Is that right? I would say yes. Uh, I feel like, unfortunately for people, the steps are often very confusing uh, because there is so much information out there, often contradictory information. So yes. we can be deliberate about following something that we think is in our best interest and find out that it's not working for us, for mm -hmm. example, something our buddy did or sister did or whatever. Um, so but what I try to do with clients is narrow it down so that the deliberateness is very specific to them so they can not be wandering in a nutritional wellness jungle. I joke with them often, you know, kind of macheteing through with like a plastic, you know, takeout teaspoon <laughs> trying to figure out yes. what the heck they should yeah. be doing here. But if you can know that there's a set of tools, a blueprint, for example, that really is suited for you, I find the motivation is much higher for people to stick with it. And then, of course, if you stick with it, you begin to get the benefits, which then increases the likelihood of you sticking with it, you know? So I get them, I tackle five things. We get energy, structure, clarity, feedback, and accountability. If people are getting that, I find they get results and are more inclined to keep on making that be lifestyle as opposed to a one-shot kick at the can. Yeah, rather than that kind of diet mentality, right? Like I think that yeah. for so many of us, there is that that idea that, okay, well, I'll just do this for the next 12 weeks. You know, I'll go on a six-week or 12-week program and, yeah. and that's going to fix me up. Realistically, if we've been having poor energy and poor mental clarity and perhaps we have been – 
you know, overweight or not, you know, yeah. like I, I'm, I'm with you. I think people can be quite healthy, uh, you know, where we all come different in different sizes. shapes and sizes. Yeah. Yeah. Obviously, you know, excess weight generally feels quite heavy when you're carrying it, right? Yeah. Like, the, and, and people do want to shift that excess weight yeah. from a perspective of health. How long realistically do you think it takes from somebody who is not particularly well? I know it, I know it's going to be a very varied <laughs> answer, but just to give people some realistic expectations, how long could it take to get well? It totally depends on the specificness of the information that I'm given. So for example, it can be a, uh, uh, I basically say, however long you've been unwell with a particular thing, you can expect the how many years that is, say it was five or six years, that you can kind of assume that it would be a month for every year for you to be able to have some resolution to that, okay? Now, you're going to start feeling better sooner than that, but I try to give people, this is like lifelong and your body has a lot of things going on. And often the issue that people come to me with, with their presenting issue is not their body's presenting issue. Their body is thinking, keep this person alive. I want to deal with the organs first. I need to get the liver cleaned out. The person is thinking, I want to drop, drop 30 pounds before my, you know, 20th high school reunion. I'm just like, okay, your body might be trying to keep you from having a heart attack. Like how much do you want to keep the weight over top of whatever? So I do that one month per year kind of thing as far as give you a good help the clients have a good guideline. But if I have people's genetics, like from 23andMe, for example, I can give them a program that in eight weeks will literally reset their gene. So, so that is the difference when you have, when I know, oh, you need to eat this amount of protein. You don't do well on carbohydrates. You need this amount of saturated fat. You have very slow phase, you have very fast phase one detox, and you need to start drinking coffee. <laughs> you know, take a full circle back to that one. Um, oh, you're doing HIIT, you know, that's why you're so sore all the time because you're actually designed for endurance, you know. So when we can cut through the what I call educated guesswork, which is what nutritionists many health professionals do. We're trained to have a broad spectrum of responses and we trial and error clients or patients for people that are doctors, et cetera, through a series of different patterns based on our best estimate from our intake forms yeah. or the diagnostics or whatever. So having genetics just cuts through that so you can go right to the chase instead of going on your, and I'm fortunate in that I've been doing nutrition for 20 plus years. So often my estimate lines up with the DNA, which is very nice. Okay. But that gives you a range kind of, of you know, a short period of time. If we have a lot of specific data all the way to a little bit longer, if we are doing a bit of trial and error. Mm. Wow. So, you know, there's, there's the old dieter in me, the quick fixer in me that goes, <laughs> What? So you can do a blood test on me or get some of the genes from me and then you can literally just print out a, you know, a program for me that says this is the kind of exercise that is best for your body. These are the kind of foods that are best for your body. This is when you ought to be sleeping. It are you, Like, is that for real? Is that, what, is that what you're saying to me? It's what I've been studying for the last seven years. And yes, absolutely. Wow. It was, I remember I have a, I have a business partner in this part of my business that's a nutritionist, but she's also a PhD biologist, which is really lovely to have if you're working in genetics, okay, or epigenetics. Definitely. But she dragged me out to a seminar, a full-day seminar, I think six or seven years ago. And I remember thinking, this is like way over my head. Like I've had biology in university, and then I have to take anatomy and physiology and chemistry, et cetera, for nutrition. But it was like, we're talking like genes, the you know, human genomes don't even map for like 20 years. And so we were pretty, probably the first in my life I've ever been cutting edge, okay? And at the same time I was going, oh my goodness, I'm so over my head. The other part of me was going, oh my goodness, if this is right, if, you know, we have this set of genes that 
we got from birth, one strand of DNA from one parent, one strand from the other parent. It's like we have this electrical panel. Think about electrical panel in your house, in the garage or the basement, wherever it is. And we, our genes are either flipped towards the, what's called the normal or wild type or towards the variant or we're heterozygous. We got one from each of one, one of those from each of our folks. And we have the ability to help those genes that are the ones that are most beneficial coding to actually enact in our life if we eat this way and exercise this way and get this amount of sleep, et cetera. Mm. And the really cool thing is that you can have a challenging uh, coding for a gene, say, usually that's usually the variant, not always, but usually the variant that makes it more um, challenging for you to get well. And while you can't make that become the other gene, your genes are your genes, you can through epigenetics, through your environment, through your supplements, through what you eat, through all those things that we talked about. It's almost like that little strip of DNA gets a little sheet pulled over it and we can impact the expression of that gene so that as a more challenging gene doesn't necessarily need to be expressed in, in our body in that way. So it's a very uh, encouraging and also weighty responsibility because it's like we have a lot more control than we want to admit sometimes uh, because <laughs> with yes. this knowledge comes responsibility. You, you know, you, you knew that, you have, I, I am extremely carb sensitive. I can produce all kinds of issues with my pancreas and insulin regulation with a lot of carbohydrates. I now know that information. <laughs> that is, if I choose to, you know, eat a ton of, you know, really tasty sourdough bread and pasta, Yum. et cetera, I am going to pay a price for that. Uh, so it's a, with knowledge comes responsibility, I guess, you know. Yeah, it really does. And is that available, you know, like worldwide? Is that something, you know, a lot of my listeners, I'm in Australia, my listeners are in Australia, you're in Canada. If, mm -hmm. you know, if, if some of my listeners in Australia wanted to work with you, is that possible? Can, do you know if we can get tested here and, and you can help us? Yes, you can. And actually I have uh, some clients in Australia. All right. Uh, one of the challenges in different countries has to do like to to get the dna the actual it's either a swab or a spit test and some countries have different legislation around mm. the privacy and security of those tests so uh, i know in some countries 23andme doesn't do the type of health and ancestry kit that i need but there's another company a canadian company that will ship anywhere in the world that fedex ships and I'm pretty sure FedEx ships in Australia. FedEx ships so, in Australia. Yeah, exactly. Yes. So that way, people that might be concerned about some of the privacy issues could instead use, it's called DNA Allure, and it's a Canadian company that will ship you a swab, and you send it back to them. They don't keep the data. They don't sell it to pharmaceutical companies. It's simply your, a copy of your, it's called a genome file. And then you have that, and that's what I use to run through the software that I'm trained in a couple different types of software program to use that. So it's all these crazy algorithms. What was that one called again? So it's 23andMe. That one's called, one? yeah, 23 Me is the biggie. Uh, and then the other one is mm -hmm. DNA Allure, A-L-L-U-R-E dot com. And again, it's a Canadian company and they have a genetics. They've got several different kits. You get the genetics one. And uh, yeah, and basically same type of pricing as 23 Me, unless 23 Me has a kit by sale on, but you know, otherwise they're very comfortable. Yep. Yeah. yeah, right. Thank you. Wow. I mean, I think that for so many of us to be able to put our health in our hands once more, you know, rather than I, I know that for myself, I, you know, I go to the doctor and, and I say, I've been peeing a lot, you know, I've been peeing a lot more so than usual. I've, dr yeah. I've always drunk a, probably a, a, a stupid amount of fluid my whole life, uh, but I've been drinking too much. They do a blood test. They do a pee test. They say nothing's wrong with you. And then that's it. That's as far as the diagnostics kind of go. Yeah. To, to have something, yeah, and that makes me feel quite powerless and quite, mm -hmm. uh, quite uh, disempowered. So, so to be in a position, you know, where 
for me, I <laughs> maybe similar to you, there's that sense of like, I do like to be in control. Yeah. But it's less about control. It's it's being in command. I like to be in, yeah. in leadership. I like to be empowered to go, I know that this is my vessel and it's my responsibility to look yeah. after it. So to have someone like you, you know, along the nutritionist and the genetic, the genetic side of things that can come along and help us to be more empowered with our health for yeah. those of us who want to live health on our terms. So it's not just... You know, like I, I often hear it, particularly now that I'm 40, I'll have people around me say things to me like, oh, yeah, well, it's all down here from here. And I push back against it all the time, Brenda. I'm like, rubbish, yeah. rubbish. Why does it have to be? I'm in the best shape of my life so far. Yeah. I've never been healthier. Yeah. I've never been fitter or stronger. Why can't Why can't this be the best, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years of my life coming up? Exactly. Oh, Brenda, how, how old are you? Is that, is that too much of a rude question? Can no, I, can no. I, can I go there? I'm 67 and a half. <laughs> 67 and a half. And, you know, a, you know, a few years ago, back 65, you're doing a six-day, you know, portage and, and kayaking or canoeing yeah. trip yeah. through the Canadian mountains. You hike into the Grand Canyon. Yeah. And for those of you who don't know, if you've never been, you can't get to the well. You can't get to the bottom and back up in a day, right? Like you exactly, yeah. They yeah. say that to you. Do not hike down no. and expect to get up in the same day. It's it's right. too deep. Yeah. So you have to go. You you have to at least stay overnight somewhere along the lines, right? Yes. There's a a, a camp at the bottom, but you have to reserve long ahead for that. So we were, did not go all the way down. We timed it so we could get back in one day, but it, you're right. We did not get all the way to the bottom. That's correct. It was stunning. And the time that we went, they had just had the most snowfall they'd had in like 40 years, five days before we got wow. there. And it was like treacherous. <laughs> we had cramp on. It was crazy. So these things that I just told you about, the scuba diving, this, you know, this, those have been my 60s on up those have all been done in the last like five years six years so i'm just trying we're, we're just trying to think what can we do next that's kind of blowing our children's minds yes <laughs> so yeah and, uh, look i think that l let's blow the minds to that that idea that oh well i'm 40 so therefore my joints this and my whatever that i just think there is so much uh oh, what's the word resignation you know, that we're resigned. Oh, well, I'm just getting old. It's like, no, you're not. Like even you at 67, you know, realistically, th there could be, there could be 20 solid years, 20, 25 totally. years left yes. in your tank. Exactly. That's a and huge so, amount of time. It's a whole it, lifetime. It, yeah. So do you want to go into that, you know, sore all the time, low energy, you know, all of this kind of thing? Or would you like to, like, we, I run uh, with my, Alicia, my PhD biologist friend, we run 12-week uh, programs where we deep dive into the genetic stuff. I've had people as old, I think the oldest person we've had in that is 83. And, and she was like, bring it on. Like, I want to learn what else I can learn to still, you know, change some things for their, and I'm like, if you're never too old, to learn some things, shift some behavior, reap some mm -hmm. benefits. Uh, that and, and and even with people that have, because I don't want to come across as like just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and you're going to be fine. There are people we talked to at the beginning about different circumstances, economically, even food security in the areas that they live, uh, potentially some uh, some genetic challenges that are not resolved easily through wellness stuff. Uh, or chronic pain from an accident, whatever. There's things that are extenuating circumstances sometimes. We typically still are able to have some impact on how those are expressed. But the least that we do, and this goes back full circle to what we were talking about before you hit record, is you have some ability to change in the responses to things. We can look at mindset. And that too can be tied to genetics, right? Do I produce enough dopamine and serotonin? Am I stuck in fight or flight because I have genes that push me into high cortisol production all the time? They don't turn the HPA axis off. So it's like we can still unpack some things so that even if we can't 
completely resolve something, we can at least have a better approach to it and maybe have some better tools, stress management tools, um, pain management tools, those kind of things to be able to mitigate the, the downside of it, I guess. The fact is, yeah, and what, what I'm hearing really loud and clearly here, Brenda, is that, yes, we can go get genetic testing and that gives us a huge amount of data, right? It gives us a huge amount of data on what's going on and what's going to be best. We are still the ones that have to pull the trigger, so to speak, you know, yeah. and, and you know, by, by all accounts so far, we're going to die one day anyway, right? <laughs> and And it's like... Those those two things are around the fact that we, you know, eventually the the whole system is going to shut down and it it we will we will fade into existence. At the same time, we can do something about remaining, well, being as well as possible within the confines of our genetic structures. Yeah, and I'm I'm seeing a correlation there of you know often my clients will will say to me I keep going there's this pattern that I, that I, that, you know, I keep, I seem to keep coming back to, you know, for, for me in my life, Brenda, you know, low self-esteem and not feeling like I'm enough self-doubt. Yeah. And that, that is a recurring theme that happens throughout my entire life. Hmm. And, and if I would, I would say that's because part of my uh, mental gene code, if I would, yeah. has been that that was in my formative years. And hmm. it's not to say that I, I always doubt myself, but I'm aware that that's part of the expression of my quote genes. It might mm-hmm. not be my actual genes, but it could be my mental code. Yeah. And it means that I'm like, cool, I'm aware that that's part of me. So when I'm going to do something scary, self-doubt's going to come up yeah. and I'm going to have to manage it this way. Yeah. I'm more likely to criticize and judge myself. So when I'm in that situation, I'm going to need to manage it this way. It's, it doesn't mean that we're fully ever eradicating. Oh yeah. I believe in myself 100% all the time. It's just that I'm well aware of how to deal with it when it does come up and it no longer is the controlling factor of my life. Like it used to be when I was disempowered and uneducated around it. Yes, exactly. Yeah. It sounds really similar in, in that thing of just the knowledge is power, but it's also responsibility. Cool. No, I, I think they totally go in hand. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm aware that that's how it is. And now I get to decide whether or not, like you say, do I, I have the sourdough and pasta? <laughs> you know, do I put myself in a, in a situation where, uh, you know, I'm around naysayers? You know, naysayers are, are more likely to bring me down because, because that was the environment that I was brought up in. Yeah. So, you know, the the epigenetics of that is that yeah. is that my self-doubt my lack of self-esteem i need to work on constantly yeah and yeah. i i really fit you know and i want to hear from you around this brenda i really want to drive home for everybody here that to be well mentally physically as well as you can be mm-hmm. let's let's take the judgment and the shame of like everybody can be 100 percent healthy i don't think that's true i'm, I'm yeah. with you but to be as well as we can be considering the internal circumstances yeah. takes maintenance. Like Brenda, do you, do you, do you just rest on your laurels now? Is that what happens? Like you're well now, so you don't have to do anything. Yeah. I can write a book about that too. <laughs> no. And that's, <laughs> that's I, when I mentioned kind of like my, no matter what, uh, I always have clients establish their own set of no matter what. So for me, it's like, I'm not always hiking down the Grand Canyon, but every day, at least probably six days a week, I am walking outside in the nature areas around us 45 minutes mm-hmm. a day. Uh, screens are off an hour before bed. We, I don't have blue light, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Room is dark, cool, all those kind of things. There are certain supplements that I have learned, both my own and in conjunction with my ND, that are super helpful for me based on my genetics. Uh, there's ways that I eat that are very consistent. I am somebody who does great on intermittent fasting. Lots of people don't. It's very taxing to their body. It, it produces excess cortisol and glucose dysregulation. I'm someone who does well on it. So most of the time I do that. I also am someone who is not addicted 
to sugar anymore. Hallelujah. <laughs> okay. Hallelujah. And so I can have the odd dark chocolate here and there, or if the kids are all coming over, make some amazing homemade oatmeal chocolate chip cookies. I can have one or two of those. They can sit in the freezer for weeks and I don't have to binge on them. So I have learned some, to be able to moderate some of these other things, but those are like no matter what. Uh, mentally, I have a favorite author uh, that I read every day uh, just for mindset around spiritual and emotional and mental matters. And I get there is, uh, oh, Richard Rohr, the most amazing old now um, Franciscan monk. I'm not Catholic, but he wrote a book called The Universe of Christ, looking at the consistent truths uh, among the world over, indigenous cultures and different faiths and that. And he has been someone that's been instrumental. You talked about the different things that we learn, paradigms we have to get busted and shifting. He's been someone that's been instrumental in busting a lot of my spiritual uh, paradigms and biases, I would say, and the organization that other members of this team are in. So yeah, that's a, no matter what for me, that is how I start my day. I don't start my day by watching the news and seeing all the challenge, very challenging things going on. I start by strengthening my spirit and that so I can, mm. I can dictate how I want to view things. You know, believing that love will win, believing that, you know, yeah. people are inherently good, even if they're behaving very badly sometimes. <laughs> yes. Brenda, I mean, we, we, I often say, guests will often have this on our conversations and you said this off air and never it could be more true. I could keep, we could keep having this conversation for a long time. There's so many, there's, I feel like we've only just scratched the surface on so many of these threads. I, I'm so fascinated by epigenetics, you know, like, uh, yeah, there's, there's so many things that, that we could be talking about here. It's absolutely incredible. It has been a pleasure having you on the show. Tell me, how can people find you? How can people work with you? Where, where do we go to get more access to you? Sure. Uh, so my company is In Balance LM, that's the lifestyle management. So InBalanceLM.com. And right at the very top of the website, it's like if you're interested in personalized wellness, click there. That takes you to the page all in some free resources around epigenetics, a little, there's a self-check evaluation that you can do there to see whether or not epigenetics might be a helpful, you know, path for you to do a little bit more of exploring in. And yeah, I work with people all over the world, uh, pretty much every continent except for Arctic and Antarctic, I think I have. And uh, Zoom has been amazing for that. And or people can get the digital copy of my book there. It's inexpensive. So whatever they feel like might be a good starting point that would most serve them where they are, there are, are lots of options there. Okay. Yeah, and we'll certainly put the the details for your website sure. into the show notes for people to be able to to go in and find you. What I'm really just hearing from you from this conversation is that there's an intentionality. You yeah. know, you have become well because you decided to to continue to be open to learning. You know, continue to it continues to this day at 67 yeah. and a half you know and and you will into your 70s and 80s and 90s and beyond yeah. and however many years you're blessed with i'm really yeah. hearing a sense of intentionality if you could sum up living life on your terms in five words what would they be faith biggie uh Family wouldn't even talk about the fact of how my family is so important that I love working my job around them. Um, friendship. And they're all family, family friendship. friendship. Yeah. A little bit of fun. And uh, and food. Those are probably it. <laughs> I love it. All the ifs. All I know. The ifs that was completely accidental. <laughs> Faith, family, friendship, fun, and food. Brenda Wallenberg, it has been an absolute joy having you on the More Confidence with Luna Guy podcast. I've loved it. You're I a great see... interviewer. I love chatting with you. 
<laughs> Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure. For those of you who want to go check out where our Brenda's uh, work, I certainly will be for sure. I'm so fascinated and curious about how how much more well that we can get so we can continue to live life on our terms and do the things that we want to do. If we do not have the energy, the mental clarity, if our emotions are not balanced, if our digestion and our sleep are off, then it impacts everything. So please go check out Brenda's work and um, I'll see you on the other side. Thanks, Brenda. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to the More Confidence with Luna Guy podcast. I hope you feel more confident, more self-assured and ready to go tackle the world's problems and maybe kick ass in some of your dreams. If you haven't already, I would love for you to like and subscribe, follow and maybe leave a review so that other people know how to find this awesome podcast too. If you're wanting to sink your teeth into something even more juicy, my number one best-selling book, Perfectly Imperfect, Your Complete Guide to Loving Yourself and Loving Your Body is now available on all good bookstore sites, both in print, digital, and I narrated it for Audible as well. If you think the coaching or maybe one of my courses is for you, why not head to www.moreconfidence.com.au and get in touch and see if we can talk. And of course, you can find me all across the social medias. That's Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, YouTube, which is where you're probably listening now, or maybe even here on the podcast platform. Sending you big love and wishing you a beautiful day.